Jonathan Evans is a, a mentor, an author, speaker, and former NFL fullback who treasures his relationship with Christ along with the opportunity to use his life to glorify God. Jonathan serves with his pastor, friend, and father, Dr. Tony Evans, both in the local church in Dallas and the national ministry. Jonathan serves as the chaplain of the Dallas Cowboys and just this year graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. He mentors youth in his home church and leads young adults around the country through a variety of ways. He is committed to developing the next generation of devoted Christian leaders. I'm sure you will enjoy and be blessed by Jonathan Evans. It's good to be here and have the opportunity to share tonight. Um, i just excited about the mission, excited about everything that's happening in Wichita. And uh, I think it's a great thing when you see, like we're going to talk about a little bit tonight, uh, people coming together in the community to serve the purposes of God. I think that's very important. But I wanted to start our evening with an apology, uh, first and foremost. Uh, do we have any Kansas State fans in the room? <laughs> well, I just, you know, as a, as a Baylor alum... <laughs> I just wanted to apologize about the rash, tough, and harsh beating um, that's going to happen to your players for the next three hours of the evening. Uh, but you're definitely in the right place uh, for the evening. Uh, but th it's been fun. Uh, I want to thank uh, the whole team. I want to thank uh, Benny for the opportunity. Uh, for bringing me in the, just to have the opportunity to share. You know, when he called me, it was pretty short and sweet, uh, the invitation. He pretty much just asked me if I believed in free speech. I said, yes. He said, good, come give one. So, uh, you know, it was, uh, so we're all on the same page. We're having fun no matter what. Uh, so it, it was good. I wanted to introduce my family because they are my support system, even though they're not here. Uh, my lovely wife, Kanika, who's making sure I get on a 5 a.m. flight in the morning because we have four kids. <laughs> and so she's handling that right now, and I'm very appreciative that she allowed me to come out here and, and spend a few moments with you guys. I have a six-year-old named Kelsey. Uh, she's the very vibrant actress in the family. I've got a four-year-old named Jonathan II. We call him J2, just to throw a little swag on it. <laughs> And I have a two-year-old named Camden. He is, we call him Spider Cam. He's not afraid of climbing on anything. And a three-month-old named Kyler. So I have two girls and two boys. So I'd like to say that I'm in the middle of the woods with no navigation. I can't get out. Can't see where I'm headed or where I'm going, but I'm trying to get it done. So you pray for me as a father in a household that's going crazy right now. Uh, but we're having fun. Um, I want to just let you know that I'm extremely humbled uh, to be here, to have the opportunity once again to share with you. And I want to make sure that you know I'm humble, unlike a lot of my Texan counterparts. You know, everything is big in Texas, so we tend to have kind of a pride that's the size of the state that we come from. And, uh, but I want to let you know that I'm not like that. I don't want you to think that I'm anything like the Texas rancher who uh, went to Europe and he was looking for a European rancher that he could ask how big his ranch was. But the only reason he wanted to ask a European rancher how big his ranch was, was so that would prompt the European rancher to ask him how big his ranch was, giving him the opportunity to do what Texans do and, and gloat about size. And so he found one and he said, uh, Mr. European rancher, how big is your ranch? The European rancher conservatively said, well, I have about 65 acres. I think that we're doing pretty well. He said, yeah, that's pretty good. And the European rancher then said to the Texas rancher, how big is your ranch? Well, it's a little bit like this. When I get in my truck, when the sun is rising in the morning, I could leave in my truck out of the garage and start driving through my property. And by the time the sun sets, I still would not have reached the end of my land. 
To which the European rancher responded, yeah, I used to have a truck like that once. <laughs> So I want to make sure we're clear that I am definitely humbled uh, to be in your presence and have a few moments. Uh, when I think about the mission and when I think about the rescue and when I think about uh, the purpose for the reason why we're here tonight, it takes me to a verse in the Bible that I want to talk to you for just a few moments, if you will. In Acts 13, 36, it's a verse about a man named David. Now, most of us know a man named David, and the reason why I like this verse is because it's a legacy verse. It's a life summary verse. It kind of shows you in one snapshot the type of man that David was, and the verse simply says this. It says, David served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he was finished. David, he served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he fell asleep. He was finished. I mean, what better life summary can you have than that? If you were to take out a pencil and paper and write down in one sentence how you would summarize your life right now, would it read similar to David's summary? And as I look at David's summary in my own life and as I live my life day to day, I live my life in such a way or try to in such a way that when it's over, I could have a summary a little bit like David's. David served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he was finished, he fell asleep. I mean, that's a life summary and a legacy, but you would think with all of the accolades in David's life, with all of the things that he accomplished, with him being the king of Israel, with him uh, uh, being a wealthy man, with him having it all, with him killing Goliath, with all of these things that he did in his life, you would think that his summary would have more to do with his accolades and his reputation than serving the purposes of God. But all of the things that he received in his life didn't have anything to do with his life summary. It was all about what he gave from his life. David served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he fell asleep. That should be important for each one of us. As we live our lives doing things that actually contribute to a legacy, that contribute to a life summary, that are meaningful, it wasn't about what he received. It was all about that which he gave. It's amazing how we can think in our life that when we're giving something, we're losing something. But when you're giving in the kingdom of God, you're gaining everything. That's why the Bible says it's better to give than it is to receive, because when you give, when you serve God's purposes, when you give out of yourself and use the situations, opportunities, gifts, and talents that God has put into your life to give to benefit the life of someone else, you're actually giving to yourself. You're giving to the future well done, my good and faithful servant. You're giving to the future summary that will be on your epitaph or the tombstone as David had when he had that summary written for his life. And how could he have such a summary? David, a man who loved God, who loved to do his will, a man after God's own heart. You know whether you're a man or woman after God's own heart because you're not living your life focusing on receiving. You're living your life focusing on giving. You want to know what impact can you make? David served the purposes of God, and it was for the benefit of his generation. That was his life summary. As I live my life, I think about writing that down in one sentence. What is the summary of my life? How would I be summarized by others? And I hope that I can live in such a way to serve the purposes of God to have a summary like David had. But you got to be careful in today's society and the opportunities that we have in America. Um, you know, we spend more of our time trying to get things done for ourselves. That's why I love the mission, because the mission, the rescue mission that we're celebrating tonight is not about self. It's about others. It's about giving. It's about perfect. It's about out outreach. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about building a summary and a legacy of meaning with the help of the people that are right in this room. It's not about input, it's about output. And the focus of our Christian lives and why God has put us here is to serve the purposes of God. 
My coach brought me into the NFL, and I remember a speech that he gave us uh, when the 2006 San Diego Chargers, and Marty Schottenheimer was the coach, and he said that you had been hand-selected, cherry-picked by none other than myself, and I'm Marty Schottenheimer. I don't make mistakes with who I choose. I saw you beforehand. You play a specific position because you have a specific skill that I saw on your game tape before I recruited you and put you on the team that I know will position us to move forward for a great season. I know what you can contribute to this team. I know the talent you have, but I need you to contribute in order for all of us collecti collectively to win the goal. If you're sitting in this seat right now, it's because God saw you beforehand. He foreknew you, and then he called you, justified you, future glorified you. And if God is for you, who can be against you when it comes to serving the purposes of God? And the last time I checked, he's God. He doesn't make mistakes with who he chooses. Because he knows that he's gathered a group of people here tonight that are Christians, that are players on his team, that he watched their game tape beforehand and said, those are the people that I need sitting in this room tonight because they're looking to give, not just receive, to use their talents, gifts, and skills as an opportunity to give to a great mission, as an opportunity to contribute to a great goal, as an opportunity to make Wichita successful on the field of play called life, adding to the life summary not only of yourself, but the men who are being helped and brought off the streets every single day by this mission. David did it, will you do it? He served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he was finished. Now, sometimes we can get into serving our own purposes, and it can be like, you know, a dog chasing his tail. When I was growing up at 10 years old, I walked into my house, and we had a to toy poodle named Solomon. Um, I have two older sisters, so they selected the dog. I don't do poodles. Um, <laughs> Um, and of course, I was the youngest, so I had no say. But we, because of my sisters, uh, had a toy poodle named Solomon. And when I would come home from school, I would catch Solomon from time to time running around in circles, chasing his own tail. And I would think to myself in my 10-year-old mind, that doesn't really make sense. Don't you know your tail is on your rear end and your mouth is on the front? You weren't created to be in the position of chasing your own tail. That's not a position that you were created to be in. And he'd be doing a lot of moving, but he's not going anywhere. He's just running around in circles trying to satisfy an intent that he wasn't even created to satisfy. And I think of a lot of Christians in the same way these days that we're running around in circles trying to satisfy an intent that we were never created for. We were created to serve the purposes of God, like the mission that we're here for tonight, to look forward and make an impact on the generation that is in need of us, that is in need of the soldiers of Jesus Christ to take their position on the field of life and come beside and support. You think it's giving, but you're really getting. You think it's losing, but you're really gaining because this is the kingdom of God that we're talking about. And I think I'm talking to kingdom people. David served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation. As an individual, you should understand this in every aspect of your life and whatever God has called you to do. I mean, if you're a teacher, you're not just a teacher. You're God's representative in education so that education can see what God looks like when God educates. If you're a lawyer, you're not just a lawyer. You're God's representative in the Bar Association so that the Bar Association can see what God looks like when God tries a case. If you're a business person, you're not just a business person. You're God's representative in business so that the world can see what God looks like when God cuts a deal. If you're a doctor, you're not just a doctor. You're God's representative in the medical field so the world can see what God looks like when God helps hurting people. Your job is to use your gifts and skills, the talents that God has given you, to go forward and serve the purposes of God with everything that you have for his glory. That's why you're here. Don't be tricked into thinking that when you're giving of yourself, you're losing. Not if you're a child of the king. Not if you've been drafted by God and placed here for a specific reason and a specific purpose in order to do a mission called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Serving the purposes of God. How do you know if you're serving God's purposes? Well, it says it in David's summary. It tells you exactly how you can know if you're serving God's purposes. It says David served the purposes of God 
for the benefit of his generation. In other words, David's generation knew he was there. David's generation was impacted by the fact that he existed. David made an impact on his generation. He wasn't just doing his thing and trying to receive what he could get from the opportunities, talents, and gifts, and wealth, and all of the things that he had attained in his life. He used what God gave them in order to impact the life of somebody else. Is that not why we're here? Is that not why we're here celebrating the mission, the rescue mission that we're here tonight is using the gifts and skills of God's people who he's placed on his team in order to make an impact in the life of somebody else, therefore contributing to their own summary. Are you contributing to the summary that you would write down right now? Are you making an effort in your life not thinking about being a receiver, but being a giver? having the opportunity to make the impact that's necessary on the kingdom team of God as you make a difference in the city of Wichita. He served the purposes of God and made an impact on his generation. Now, speaking of impact, I uh, had a friend uh, probably about a year ago that invited me for a game of bowling. It was just a casual game of bowling, so I thought. I came in with cargo shorts and a t-shirt just thinking we were having a casual game. And then I look in and Jerry walks in with his bowling slacks, bowling shirt, bowling bag, bowling ball, bowling glove. And I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. This is just a casual evening of bowling, Jerry. What are you doing? He's got his whole thing. He's got his. So I'm getting a little nervous because I'm kind of competitive naturally because of my background. So I don't think this is going to go too well for me. And he comes in and he's like, are you ready to go? I said, I guess, you know, I'm going over to get my bowling ball off the rack. You know, (laughs) he's got his bag. He's got a custom fit for his fingers. So I'm like, this is not going to go too well. I go first, you know, just take my little stance. I bowl the ball. It's a spare. I got one stand, then I hit it. You know, I'm I'm starting pretty well, but I'm still a little nervous because Jerry gets up there and he unzips his bag. He pulls out his ball. He takes the towel and wipes it down first. (laughs) He puts his fingers in the ball. He takes his stance. He cocks it. He walks. He bowls. He flicks his wrist and kicks out the leg, by the way. At the end, all the while, his ball is rolling right down the gutter. (laughs) And now it provides Jonathan Evans with the opportunity to be myself, a little facetious and talkative. And I told him, hey, um, Jerry, you do know the point of bowling is to knock down the pins, uh, don't you? You see all the pins are still standing. Now, you look good, but since the point of bowling is impact, I just have to say that you're a good-looking failure. (laughs) And so I'm coming on to Jerry because we just have that type of relationship, but I had to make sure he understood the point of the game. The point of the game is not to just look good rolling gutter balls. The point of the game is to knock down the pins. A lot of times as Christians, we can be focused on what we have and how we look when we go to church and what esteemed um, business that we're in and our reputation and how things look to the outside world. But the point of being a Christian, the point of being on God's team, the point of being selected beforehand to the field of Wichita is to knock down some pins. It's to make an impact with the opportunities, talents, and gifts that God has given you, not to roll gutter balls as a good-looking Christian. And we have to define that for ourselves, and the opportunity is sitting right in front of us tonight with the mission, with having the ability to come alongside an organization that's doing great things as you've already heard and as you've seen in your community as they go forward to make an impact. You know, 1,500 people died uh, on the Titanic, if you remember the story. But 1,500 people didn't have to die because there were, ha- there were lifeboats that were half filled by people who were saved and comfortable who thought it would be too much of a risk to turn around to save anybody else. And so people were drowning, people were cold, people lost their life because people who were saved thought it too risky to turn around to save somebody else. But we have a mission. We have a rescue mission. And they're taking their lifeboats and they're going out into the waters. 
And you have men whose lives are, are drowning, whose lives are being uh, uh, beaten on, and who have tumultuous circumstances and different things that they're facing, but the mission is getting in the boat, and they're asking you to get in with them, put on your life jacket, grab a paddle, because it's time to swim in and grab some guys and put them in the boat. They don't have to suffer with the saints that are in this room right now. The opportunity to write to your own legacy doesn't mean you're receiving. It means you start by giving. The opportunity to change your summary, the opportunity to hear what you want to hear from the coach that drafted you to be on the team, the well done, my good and faithful servant. You were faithful over few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many. And you've heard it time and time again. And as I look at David's summary, it just puts a charge in me and hopefully a charge in you to serve the purposes of God, to make an impact in your generation. You say, well, what impact can I make? And an individual person, what can I do? The, the, you know, I've heard about the power of one and all of those different things, but really, if I come alongside as an individual, how much does that really help? Well, I can tell it to you like this. If you're a messed up person and you belong to a family, I guarantee you'll contribute to a messed up family. If you're a messed up person that'll contribute to a messed up family and that family is a part of a neighborhood, then that messed up family will make its contribution to a messed up neighborhood. Now, if you're a messed up person which will contribute to a messed up family, that family contribute to a messed up neighborhood and that neighborhood goes to the church, well, then your messed up neighborhood will make its contribution to a messed up church. Now, if you're a messed up person, which will contribute to a messed up family, that family contribute to a messed up neighborhood, that neighborhood to a messed up church, and that church is supposed to be the light to the city, well, now your church is going to make its contribution to a messed up city. So now, if you're a messed up person, which will contribute to a messed up family, that family contribute to a messed up neighborhood, that neighborhood to a messed up church, church to a messed up city, and your city is a part of a state, then your messed up city will naturally make its contribution to a messed up state. So if you're a messed up person, which will contribute to a messed up family, that family contribute to a messed up neighborhood, that neighborhood to a messed up church, that church to a messed up city, that city to a messed up state, and your state is a part of a country, well, then naturally your state will make its contribution to a messed up country. So if you're a messed up person, which will contribute to a messed up family, that family contribute to a messed up neighborhood, that neighborhood to a messed up church, that church to a messed up city, that city to a messed up state, that state to a messed up nation, and your nation is a part of the world then quite naturally, your messed up nation will make its contribution to a messed up world. So, if you want a better world illuminated by better nations, inhabited by better states, illuminated by better cities, inhabited by better churches, illuminated by better neighborhoods, inhabited by better families, then you have to start by becoming a person of purpose who will serve the purposes of God for the benefit of their generation. And the opportunity sits right in front of you. The opportunity sits right in front of you here tonight, coming alongside, jumping in the lifeboat, alongside of a mission that you know works, a mission that's been around 65 years, a mission that's been hitting the streets hard in Wichita, Kansas. The opportunity not only to give to someone else, but the opportunity to rewrite your own summary. So it sounds and reads a little bit more like David's on a day-to-day -day basis. David, he served the purposes of God for his generation, and then he was finished. He fell asleep. That's the one thing. We got a lot of differences in the room, but I can tell you one thing we have in common. This thing eventually comes to a close. For everyone in the room. That's just life. Eventually it ends. And then you go to evaluation day, which in football we call the team meeting room where you watch the film of the game you just played. And God's going to want to know, were you serving the purposes of God? Did you jump in the lifeboat? Did you turn around to feed, to shelter the least of these that you did for them? You did it to me. That's rewriting the summary. My dad uh, would always talk about his favorite game. Monopoly uh, was his favorite game growing up because that's the only time in the hood he got to own land. <laughs> <laughs> so
So he would, he would take out, you know, the game and uh, he'd play it with the kids. And, of course, he'd be beating us, but, you know, he'd play it with us. And he was looking at two things when he put that board out to the right. Boardwalk and Park Place. They're the premier properties. His trumpistic skills kicked in and he, you know, he thought he was doing something. He'd get the, you know, the greenhouses, put them out there, charge us rent. We're losing money by the second. And then he'd rezone and go commercial <laughs> with the red hotels. Y'all are with me now. Charging the kids more money. We're losing. By the end of it all, he's received it all. He's got the houses, he's got the land, he's got the red hotels, he's got all of his kids' money. We ain't got no money. But he took our fake money that we had. I mean, he's sitting with it all. And then he'd always talk about that terrible moment when he came back to reality. The game was over. You gotta put it all back in the box. You don't get to keep it, you get to stay in the hood, you don't have land. You put the houses back, you put the hotels back, you put the money back, and then they close the box. Game over. Then you realize that all that stuff you attain during that little 45 minute game you were playing no longer matters. Right now, living life is the same, isn't it? One day, we have the same thing in common. You're gonna put it all back. And on that day, it will no longer matter to you what you left behind. On that day, you could care less what you left behind and all the things that you've attained and all of those great accomplishments that you On that day, it, all that matters to you on that day is not what you left behind. All that matters to you is what you forwarded ahead. And today, you have that opportunity to start forwarding ahead. David served the purposes of God for the benefit of his generation, and then he was finished. I think tonight you should think to yourself, you know what, it's worth it. It's worth it to be a giver, not just a receiver. It's worth it to give. It's worth it to rewrite my summary. It's worth it to come alongside the mission. It's worth it to rescue. It's worth it to get in the boat. It's worth it. As I conclude, it was a little girl who wanted to go to the zoo with her dad. She said, Dad, can I invite a few friends? The doorbell rang. Nine more girls showed up. <laughs> so he employed the wife. Well, they got two vans. Everybody jumped in. They went to the zoo. Ten girls. They walked around, they had a good time, they saw the animals, but then they came up on this unique situation that Zoo was doing that day. They had elephant rides. The little girl said, Dad, it's elephant rides. Can we go? He said, what do you mean, we? It's 10 of y'all. How much does it cost to go on those elephant rides? She said, it's, it's $20, it's $20. He said, no, it's not $20, it's 20 times 10 is a little bit more than $20. I don't think we're going to be, to be able to go on this ride. She said, Dad, it's an elephant. <laughs> he said, I see the elephants, but I also see my pocketbook, and we're not going to be able to go on this elephant ride today. She said, Dad, wait, no, you don't understand. It's worth it. It's an elephant. <laughs> he said, Honey, I understand that it's an elephant. I see the elephants. I see how spectacular it is and how fun it looks. I see all of that. But I just can't come up with that money. That's too many girls. It's $20 a girl. It's, a, it's too much. She said, Dad, you don't understand how worth it this is. It's an elephant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a life. Is it worth it? David served the purposes of God for his generation, and then he fell asleep. The question is tonight, 
will you. Thank you for having me. I'm Jonathan Evans.